Well, the reality is it doesn't really matter who U.S. president is. The U.S. president is nominally the commander in chief of the U.S. empire. But we all know that when it comes to actual foreign policy decision making, the president is quite weak and there is a much larger apparatus. You can call it the deep state. You can call it the national security state. You can simply call it the state. You can call it an empire. This is you need some kind of apparatus to run an empire. How are you supposed to oversee 800 foreign military bases, constant operations around the world, constant wars? The reality is that, and this isn't even looking at the political economy element of it. I mean, the U.S. economy is so inextricably tied to war. The military industrial complex is a huge part of U.S. manufacturing. It's funny because we hear that, you know, some defenders of the U.S. neoliberal model would say that critics are, they, Ex they exaggerate the degree to which the U.S. economy has deindustrialized. And they say, well, the U.S. is still, after China, the second largest producer of manufactured goods. But in reality, when you look at U.S. industry, a huge part of that is the military industry. <laughs> so it it's, I mean, the reality, and, and of course, we know that military contractors fund politicians from both parties. They have very significant influence. The, the whole lobby argument, especially like the Israel lobby, I do not find very convincing the, because the reality is that people say, well, you know, APAC funds politicians, but that's how the U.S. political system functions. It's not just Israel. It's every single industry. It's every single politician. Their campaign is funded by big companies, the financial sector, the real estate sector. This is how U.S. politics works. It's not like Israel is some exception to that. And because the U.S. is not a, a, a democracy, we all know that, of course, bourgeois democracies everywhere are not real democracies. But especially in the case of the U.S., it is capital that determines how all these decisions are made. It's so clear in, in the U.S. election right now between Trump and Kamala. So uh, basically, if you really want to simplify it, BlackRock is linked to the Democratic Party, the biggest asset manager in the world. And Blackstone is funding Donald Trump's campaign, the highest compensated executive on Wall Street, Stephen Schwartzman, a billionaire, uh, the CEO of Blackstone, this private equity fund, the, the largest alternative asset manager in the world. He is funding Donald Trump's campaign. And actually, um, Trump is, of course, he's a billionaire. The, the extent to which he was supposedly like this underdog candidate who was supposedly resisting the, the you know, establishment, it's nons a nonsensical narrative. In this campaign, it's even more nonsensical because in previous campaigns, if you look at his campaign contributors, contributors, he did not get as much from the financial sector and other parts of big capital that, that as the Democrats. But in this campaign, that's actually not true. In this campaign, there are a lot of billionaires and parts of the financial sector that are backing Trump. And it's very obvious to, it's very easy to explain why. Trump has said very clearly that he's gonna continue uh, the tax cuts that he gave to big billionaires, and he's going to extend them further, uh, cut taxes even further. He also wants to bring down the corporate tax rate. And his argument is that we don't want, really want any taxes on the rich. Instead, we're going to have tariffs that will make up for lost revenue, which is hilarious. We all know that's going to lead to very high rates of inflation in the U.S. Now, in terms of foreign policy, I've been arguing again that the U.S. president does not have very significant influence over U.S. foreign policy. You can't run an empire if every four years you have another leader who comes in and significantly changes foreign policy. Again, the foreign policy apparatus oversees that, which is a massive apparatus involving many thousands of people in the State Department, in the Defense Department, especially the Pentagon. I mean, the Pentagon does not change all of senior... I mean, well, there are a few top members of the Defense Department that change that are appointments, but the vast majority of the Defense Department, the vast majority of the State Department as well, continue regardless of who the U.S. president is. Now, let's look at the policies that they're proposing. Trump says he's going to end the war in Ukraine. I think he actually probably would. But I also think regardless of whether or not who wins, the war in Ukraine is going to end soon, even if Kamala Harris wins. It's not, it's very clear. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that Ukraine has been losing very badly. And Ukraine's invasion of Russia, attacks inside Russian territory, are a negotiating tactic. This is even being acknowledged by mainstream analysts and Western think tanks.
who are vehemently anti-Russian. They know that the Ukrainian military is in a very dire situation. The average age of Ukrainian soldiers fighting against Russia are between 43 and 45 years. I mean, Ukraine has very low uh, reserves of ammunition. There are reports that there are huge numbers of Ukrainian soldiers that are just disobeying orders. So much so that the Ukrainian military had to allow for the first defense, insubordination. They legalized insubordination because so many tens of thousands of soldiers who are being conscripted are just completely ignoring the, the orders made by their by their officers and are just, just leaving. They're just fleeing. So it's very clear that Ukraine is losing badly and there needs to be some kind of process to, to bring about a negotiated settlement. It's inevitable. And Clearly, the Democrats are not going to do that before the election because it would be a huge political blow. But honestly, I think even if the Democrats win, they're going to have to make some kind of negotiated settlement, not only because Ukraine is losing, but because there's a bipartisan consensus in Washington that China is the biggest so-called threat. Look at the article that was written by the CIA director, William Burns, Mr. Burns, and in Foreign Affairs magazine, the magazine of the Council on Foreign Relations, he said very clearly that Russia is only a short-term threat. China is the biggest so-called long-term threat. This is language that has been reiterated in the national defense strategy of the Pentagon and many other documents from the U.S. government saying that Russia is a short-term threat. China is the biggest long-term threat. And the CIA director said that he boasted that the CIA has doubled its budget for anti-China operations. The CIA has created a mission center focused on China. It's the only mission center the CIA has focused on one country. And this is bipartisan. In fact, this September, there was something in the, in the U.S. Congress known as China Week, where in one week, the U.S. House of Representatives passed 25 pieces of legislation that were anti-China. 25 anti-China bills in one week. It's very clear what direction the political winds are blowing in. This is bipartisan. By the way, those bills had bipartisan support from Republicans and Democrats. So I actually don't buy this argument that Trump's, some Trump supporters are making, that if Trump wins, he'll be a peace president, he'll end the war in Ukraine. That's outrageously stupid. No, regardless of who wins, there's going to be more war, especially on China. Trump, when he was president, this idea that he didn't wage any war is also outrageously stupid. Trump, in his own words, expanded the military occupation of Syria. He boasted that we're taking Syria's oil. Trump did not withdraw troops from Afghanistan. Biden has been a horrible, odious, reprehensible president. One of the only very positive, well, very few positive things that he's done. I mean, you can I, I can count them in one hand. Basically, nothing that he's done has been good. But he did withdraw troops from Afghanistan. I mean, he's carrying out, he's backing a genocide in Israel. He's done all these horrible things. I'm not praising Biden. What I'm saying is that Biden did this thing that Trump said he would do. I'm not saying that Kamala Harris will be better than Trump. I think they both will be, again, indistinguishable. They will be the managers of the U.S. empire. So I'm not arguing that uh, these people, they're, it's funny that, for decades, we've been told by some leftists who are sympathetic to the Democrats that the Democrats are supposedly a lesser evil. And now we actually see some people reversing that and saying that Trump is a lesser evil. That's that's nonsense. It doesn't matter who the U.S. president is. And again, looking back in Trump's first administration, Trump waged war on Venezuela. There's this narrative that Trump didn't start a new war. Well, you can only believe that if you consider what he did against Venezuela, not a war. It was absolutely a war. According to the former UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Alfred Desayas, and then if you also look at reports done by, for instance, Jeffrey Sachs and Mark Weisbrot, tens of thousands of Venezuelans died from the US sanctions. Alfred Desayas estimated more than 100,000 Venezuelans. I mean, we all know that sanctions are just as deadly as conventional war, if not deadlier as we saw with the sanctions on Iraq in the 1990s that led to hundreds of thousands of deaths that were famously defended by Madeleine Albright. So this narrative that Trump didn't wage a new war, what he did against Venezuela was absolutely a war against Syria. He expanded the war in Yemen. 
He did not withdraw the troops from Afghanistan. He backed many coup attempts. And Trump boasted of giving offensive weapons to Ukraine that Obama didn't give. There's this famous clip of Trump boasting. He said, Obama only gave Ukraine uh, pillows and sheets or pillows and blankets. I gave Ukraine lethal weapons. Now, obviously, that's ridiculous. Obama did give military equipment to Israel, although he claimed that it was non-lethal, which is one of these euphemisms the U.S. government loves, like their claim that Israel is is de-escalating by escalating in Lebanon. So, of course, Obama backed the coup in Ukraine. He gave he did give military equipment to Ukraine, but Trump also expanded that even further. The Trump administration, Trump voluntarily appointed as his national security advisor, one of the hard, most hardline neoconservatives, John Bolton, and his state secretary of state was first Rex Tillerson, an oil executive, which says a lot about what interests the U.S. State Department serves. And then after Rex Tillerson, it was the former CIA director, another hardline neoconservative, Mike Pompeo. So Trump voluntarily appointed them. No one forced him to appoint these neoconservatives as his top national security officials. And then Trump, uh, his administration tore up the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and he tore up the Open Skies Treaty. So destroying all of the late Cold War or, or 90s arms infrastructure, or arms, uh, arms uh, treaties with Russia, which only further exacerbated the situation and pressured and encouraged Russia to seek written security guarantees after the U.S. had torn up past security treaties, arms treaties. So I don't buy this idea. I, and obviously, we all know that Kamala Harris, she will not run her foreign policy. She has no foreign policy experience. Every time she's asked about it, she puts her foot in her mouth. She's very ignorant. I like to point out that when, as vice president, when Kamala Harris was given the mission to go to Central America. She famously said, do not come. Uh, she insulted everyone she spoke with in Central America. And then when she went to Vietnam, she insulted her Vietnamese hosts by laying a wreath at the site where war criminal John McCain was shot down when during the Vietnam War, John McCain was bombing Vietnamese light bulb factories. And so she has no foreign policy experience. If you look at the people that Kamala has around her as her foreign policy advisors, they're from the same coterie of think tanks in Washington who who all support the same policies. So, no, I don't buy this idea that U.S. foreign policy will be any different. If you read anything from a mainstream think tank in Washington, from the Rand Corporation, it's all clear that the U.S. is focused on the new Cold War on China moving more forces to East Asia, expanding the network of U.S. military bases in East Asia. The U.S. has done this by creating four new military bases in the Philippines and the new leader of the Philippines, who's the son of the former you know, U.S.-backed dictator Marcos. He is greatly deepening his, relation, his country's relations with the U.S. We see that in Japan and South Korea, they're solidifying their military partnership with the U.S., talking about expanding NATO into the Pacific region. I mean, of course, there are a few outliers here, which is like, you know, India, a major outlier. Vietnam, although I actually think Vietnam's policy is very clear of non-alignment. They're not going to get involved. Um, Indonesia maybe could be one of these, these uh, countries that goes either way, although Indonesia is leaning much more toward China. But the reality is that regardless of who wins, foreign policy will be basically the same. What I think actually could be a little different is economic policy. That is actually usually in presidential elections, basically 95% of policies will be exactly the same. The only differences really are economic policy around the margins. Maybe like they'll change like the amount they tax the rich by two or 3%. And maybe obviously cultural policy, things like abortion, which is obviously very important. I'm not saying that's insignificant, but one in this election, actually one area that is quite different is the issue of tariffs. If Trump wins, I think he is serious about massively expanding tariffs. Clearly, the Biden administration and the Democrats are not opposed to tariffs, but they only are using targeted tariffs against specific Chinese technologies, electric vehicles, semiconductors, 
uh, quantum computing parts with export restrictions. Also, of course, solar panels, um, uh, critical minerals. But if Trump comes in, he is very serious about across the board expanding tariffs, not only in China, but in other countries. And he says that he wants blanket tariffs of at least 60 percent on all Chinese goods, which, by the way, would result in, in quite high inflation in the U.S. So, again, foreign policy does not change regardless of how the, who the U.S. president is. That's a, it's an infantile view of how U.S. foreign policy is, oper is operates and is made. And economic policy could be a little different. And, you know, Kamala Harris, obviously, I'm not expecting her in any way to tangibly reverse the decades of neoliberal policy. She is talking about maybe having uh, a, a, a tax on unrealized capital gains. They may do that. But even if they do that, I don't expect it to be very high. I think it, to be mostly, it will be mostly symbolic. And I don't think she's going to cut taxes on the rich even further like Trump will. But even then, the majority of their economic policy will probably still be the same. I found your take on uh, Russia Ukraine uh, interesting because, like, I think it is very, very obvious that in uh, the case of Palestine or, or China, both the parties are like they have the same policies. Uh, but I was reading foreign affairs and I found um, the columnists there to be divided. Like, there are some, as you referenced, who would say that our greater priority is China. And so maybe, like, it's not a good idea to to keep pushing this war in Ukraine. Uh, but there are many hawkish in, in foreign affairs who still double down that. Uh, and there is great anxiety about coming back of uh, Trump because they think at least whether it's true or not, we don't know because as the New York Times leaked of the New York Times documents uh, uh, show clearly that since 2017, CIA operations in Ukraine uh, massively increased. This was in the period, period of Trump. Uh, I, I thought uh, things are not as clear on what's going to happen in Russia, Ukraine. But what you were suggesting is that uh, it's going to be the same. Yeah, well, again, you also have to understand the party apparatus. We talked about the national security apparatus. So the fact is that in the Pentagon and the State Department, the vast majority of, of officials stay the same regardless of administration. It's especially true for the CIA. I mean, we don't even know how half of, we don't know the majority of what they do. But in terms of the parties themselves, institutionally, both parties are deeply committed to antagonizing both Russia and China. So Trump does represent a small branch within the, a small faction within the Republicans who are a little more critical of Ukraine. And there's this idea that they love Russia. I mean, I think that's obviously exaggerated. It's not that they love Russia, but they want Russia to, at the very least, not be a U.S. enemy so they can focus on China or an ideal scenario, they would like to ally with Russia against China. We know that's never going to happen. The fact that that Russia started this new phase of the war is an acknowledgement that they recognize that their economic future. It lies with integration with Eurasia, with China, India, the other major growing economies in Asia. Of course, China is by far Russia's biggest trading partner. And they have very, in terms of uh, where they specialize, they have economies that that go go together very well. Of course, Russia has some of the world's largest natural resource reserves of major minerals, uh, of oil, of gas. China is the world's manufacturing superpower, but also Russia does have significant industry and they can be complementary in certain ways. So for instance, Russia's military technology is more advanced than that of China and they've been collaborating so uh, obviously this this idea that that the Trumpists have that they could ally with Trump against China is cartoonishly absurd. Um, but if you listen to the rhetoric of, for instance, of people like uh, Steve Bannon, Steve Bannon for years, even before Trump was campaigning for president in 2016, Bannon was saying that China is the Antichrist. China is everything that, that he and those those kind of far right Republicans hate. It's a country, a socialist, uh, a socialist country led by a communist party. It uh, it is atheistic. It is non-white, um, and they see Russia as capitalist since the overthrow of the Soviet Union, as Christian, as white, as European. But 
again, that misunderstands the geopolitics and the economics of the situation. Um, but I mean, even actually Henry Kissinger famously had argued for this reverse Kissingerian triangulation strategy of trying to, you know, improve relations with Russia to isolate China. It wasn't even it wasn't just Trump and Kissinger and Bannon. It was actually the first Obama administration and the Hillary Clinton State Department. This fact is often forgotten because Clinton is such a hawk. But right when she came into the State Department in the first Obama administration, she famously met with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. And there was this stunt where she had a button, a red button that she pressed for resetting Russia relations. Clearly, we saw what happened there with the coup in, in Ukraine and the, the sanctions on Russia and the massive uh, massive deterioration in U.S.-Russia relations. But um, there, was a, there was a moment where it could have been possible. Uh, Bush famously met with um, Putin and he said, I saw, I met with Putin, I, I looked into his eyes, I saw his soul, I saw that he wants, you know, he's a, he's a good man and wants the same thing as that we do. Um, there was a moment where it could have been possible, but for a variety of reasons, expansion of NATO, the refusal of the U.S.-led West to allow Russia to economically integrate on equal terms with the West. Russia, because uh, because Putin is a nationalist, because the Russian ruling class, although certainly they're not socialists, they do have their own national interests. And because the U.S.-led Western institutions refuse to allow Russia to integrate on equal footing, they were forced to because of their own economic and national interests to ultimately stand up against what the U.S. and NATO were doing. And then Putin gives his famous speech at the, at the Munich Security Conference in 2008 and announces that, you know, there is this new attempt to, to bring about hegemony. He used the term hegemony. So the point is, anyway, fast forwarding, um, if you look inside the Republican Party, that that kind of idea is still a minority. The majority of the Republican leadership in the, in the Senate and in the House is still extremely pro-Ukrainian. Look at people like Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham has taken all these trips to Kiev. He stands with Zelensky and says, we have to keep arming Ukraine. He also says we need to get their tens of trillions of dollars of minerals and prevent China and Russia from getting their minerals. So again, even if, if you believe that Trump is somehow deeply committed to peace, which I do not believe. And you believe that Trump, he wants to stop all of these wars, which I do not believe. You also, even if he wins the, the presidency, you have to look at all of the structural impediments. I mean, this idea that the US president just controls all of this policy and can do whatever he or she wants, again, is an infantile view. You have to have a structural analysis. And the reality is that Trump may believe whatever he believes, but he's working within a party that is full of people who are deeply committed to the U.S. imperial project, a, a key part of which is, is weakening and ultimately balkanizing Russia. That's the goal. It's to carve up Russia, as Brzezinski famously had proposed in the 1990s, creating a European Russia, Siberian Russia, and an Asian Russia. I mean, ultimately, they, they're institutionally committed to deepening this this project of of destroying Russia and that only incentivizes Russia further to deepen its integration with China and Asia as a whole and one person even if it's the president cannot get in the way of that talking about the empire democracy and election and I I want you to be brief on this I mean I remember from our last uh, discussion when you were on our show and this is like an uncharitable reading of what actually you said, just to provoke you a bit more. Um, I'm th wondering what's your take or thoughts about uh, the third party, uh, particularly um, uh, Jill Stein, uh, presidential uh, candidate from uh, the Green Party. Um, uh, are you still uh, completely hopeless about democracy within empire or do you think uh, 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 someone like Jill Stein can be helpful both for American people and war peace in general. Well, I wouldn't say I'm hopeless about democracy. I'm hopeless about bourgeois democracy, capitalist democracy, which is not democracy. We all know that. I mean, and China has done an important service in 
trying to rescue the term democracy. There's not only one model of so-called democracy, which is where every four years you have people go to the poll to vote for two representatives of billionaire oligarchs who want war around the world. And you have no other options. You have no other contribution to the government, to policy. Policy is made by corporate lobbyists. I mean, that's not democracy. If anyone calls it democracy, I mean, they're fooling themselves. But the reality is that the U.S. system uh, is designed in a way where democracy is basically impossible. So, uh, I mean, I think democracy would be good, an actual real democracy, which can't happen under a capitalist system in which politics is completely controlled by the capitalist class, the ruling class that by politicians, especially in a system like the U.S., where with Citizens United, there is no limit on the amount of money that can flood politics. And in the case of a third party, I think we, I mean, I do agree that we have to use every means that we can to resist this system. And I, and I support anyone on the left running third parties. I think it's important to get your message out there so people can hear that there can potentially be alternatives. But I think we should not fool ourselves and, and, and try to tell people, you have to vote for Jill Stein because she can win. No, everyone knows that she can't win. The third party can't win. And this is, I mean, if the, third, if the Green Party actually came close to winning, they would either destroy the Green Party or they would co-opt the Green Party. I mean, this, is, this has happened in so many, look at what happened to Jeremy Corbyn. Um, just a complete, uh, not just co-optation, a complete sabotage, destruction, involving parts of the British security apparatus, intelligence agencies, the media. Um, so I think we should support people to vote third party if they're not going to vote simply as a protest. And it's important to have someone campaigning on a, a pro peace platform. Also, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, the PSL, has a very important uh, campaign running um, with two great candidates. And I think that they can definitely also have a positive impact. They're on the they're on the ballot in in, I think, over a dozen states. So, I mean, these are protest campaigns, um, but we, I don't think in our messaging, I think it's a waste of time to try to convince people. I think it's it's honestly uh, it's puzzling why you would try to convince people that you should vote because there's a chance that, that they can win. They know they're not going to win. That's not the point. The point is to run as a protest candidate and to actually have peace as a possibility to talk about imperialism, to talk about war, to talk about capitalism. Like these are issues that are never mentioned ever. You look at the presidential debates, they have no discussion of war, no discussion. Certainly they would never mention the word empire, or imperialism. They would never mention the word capitalism. So it's important to have those issues on the table. On, on that note of uh, cynicism about who's a democracy and empire, uh, if you could tell us- It's not cynicism, it's realism. I mean, yes. this is, you know, bourgeois democracy is exactly what so-called democracy was in the age of the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, it was democracy only for the slave owners. Now it's democracy only for the, the stock owners, for the investor class.